an incredible coincidence today. Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. She called us to live to a higher standard and not be satisfied with just a little empty religion in our lives as a shallow substitute for what we could have. As our series continues, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who were influenced by the life of Elizabeth Elliot and her important message. Hey, it's good to have you with us. Well, we wrap up our series called A Trip to Ecuador today as we hear about an incredible coincidence and about the Alcas today. Frank Kohlinger was a missionary in Ecuador for many years. He'll talk about going hunting with the Alcas and more. Also from decades ago, we have uh, part of a question and answer series, Ed McCauley and Jim Elliott back to talk about whether there were still some who had not heard about Jesus. That coming later. First, though, it's part four of A Trip to Ecuador. What is this incredible coincidence that Elizabeth has to tell us about? You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says, and underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, continuing my story today of a most marvelous trip that my husband and I took to Ecuador in 1996, in January. We went with my daughter and her husband, Valerie and Walt Shepard, and their oldest son, Walter, who had been spending three months in Peru with his uncle, Bert Elliott, Jim Elliott's older brother. And we went to the jungle to visit my Quechua friends, and we had a most wonderful time visiting Pano, a little place where there used to be a mission station owned by the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And then we went to Shandia, S-H-A-N-D-I-A. Shandia was the place where Jim Elliott and Pete Fleming had first worked when they went to Ecuador in 1952. They spent a year there rebuilding some old buildings and building some new ones. And in the providence of God, all five of those buildings were completely demolished in a flood. So we went there, we saw the cliff over which all those buildings had fallen, and we visited the house that Jim had built, which is still standing, and in which a group of Indians are now living. And I said yesterday that a most incredible coincidence occurred while we were sitting in the living room of the Jim Elliott house. We were having a little lunch of chicha and manioc, and suddenly up Over the rise of the little trail that goes down through the jungle came a foreigner, a tall, thin, very blonde young man dressed in a motorcycle suit, and he had an Indian with him. He came into the house. He walked straight over to me with his hand outstretched, and he said, I've read your books. Well, we all almost fainted. You don't see foreigners in that area of the jungle very much. One would certainly not expect a man from Switzerland, whose mother tongue was German, to have ridden his motorcycle that day from Quito after having read many of my books over a period of years. He had this great desire to see the house that Jim Elliot had built. Little could he have imagined that he was going to meet the wife of Jim Elliot sitting there in the living room at that very moment. Now, is God the one who orders the circumstances of our lives? Someone has said, what a pagan calls circumstances, we call the will of God. Well, it was a wonderful time that we had together. The young man, of course, was also given some lunch. He sat down with us, he asked me questions, and then, of course, he wanted a tour of the house. He wanted to see where I had written Shadow of the Almighty, which he had read in German, Passion and Purity, Through Gates of Splendor. I don't know what all he had read that's been translated into German. But, of course, he spoke English as well. We sat there. He wanted to see everything that I wanted to show him in the house. Then, finally, it was time for us to go. We made our way back through the jungle trail along the cliff and down what used to be our airstrip, which is now a road, and said goodbye to our Quechua friends. And once again, 
took a bus back to the little place called Pano, where we had spent the previous night. Again, we spent another night there. We went down and enjoyed the beach, the rocky beach. Walter, my grandson, went swimming, and a little boy from across the river came over in a canoe, poling a dugout canoe all by himself, a little boy not more than eight or ten years old, I guess, and he took Walter for a ride in that dugout canoe. We had a nice time, a lovely time, praying together, talking with Clemente Chimbu, who is a Christian man in charge of the whole eastern jungle network for Quechua Indians who have radios. This also, shall I say, just about blew my mind, because there was no such thing as a jungle network of radios. And so Clemente asked me if I would be willing to be interviewed. Well, of course. How could I say no to that? But you can certainly be sure that it was the first and probably the last interview on the radio that I've ever done in Quechua. I'm probably a bit more fluent in Quechua than I am in Spanish because uh, we lived in the jungle the whole time I was in Ecuador. We were only in, I was only in Quito for six months when I first got there, so Spanish was kind of rusty. But the Indians, of course, listen to the radio, and they want Quechua programs. So Clemente asked me all sorts of questions, and I did my best to answer them. And then the next day was Sunday, and we took the bus back to Tena, the sort of jumping-off place, went to church, and there were some people there, quite a few Christians there, who had known me or had known of Jim and me, because, of course, foreigners are freaks, and everybody knows you and remembers you. It's much easier for them to remember us than it is for us to sort out who they are sometimes. After church, a pilot with Missionary Aviation Fellowship flew into Tena, picked us up, and took us to the airstrip that Steve Saint has built in a place that he has named Nimompadi on the Kurarai River. Steve Saint is the son of Nate Saint, pilot with Missionary Aviation Fellowship, who was the one who started what was called Operation Alka back in 1955, the one who dropped gifts to the Alka Indians and who, in January of 1956, was killed by those same Indians. Well, Steve has gone back there as a missionary and as a pilot and he and his wife have established an amazing village surrounded with a number of Indian houses. Steve has built quite a large board house. He's teaching the Indians how to use things like chainsaws and motor motors for their canoes because many, many oil companies have moved into that area. I can suppose that some of my listeners would be thinking, now why do the missionaries want to go in there and change their culture like that? The answer, of course, is we don't want to, but it's inevitable. When 25 oil companies are drilling in the eastern jungle of Ecuador, civilization has come, and along with civilization come many things that you and I would not call blessings that the white man introduces. But Steve is doing his best to try to help these Indians make a transition from being hunters and gatherers to workers with some of them with the oil companies, and others who just need to know how to cope with the tremendous changes that are happening in that part of the, of the jungle. Can you hear the rain in the background? We're having a big storm as I'm recording this, and that's very appropriate because we had some very big rainstorms. So we went to Steve's house. Steve had invited us to come and spend two nights with his wife, Ginny, his teenage son, Jesse, and his daughter, Stephanie. We had a most marvelous time. When the plane landed, there were the Indians, the Auka Indians, who are now called Waurani, people whom I had known when I lived with the Indians who had killed my husband. Two of the men who had had part in that spearing, Minkayi and Kimo, were there. You can imagine the first thing they said to me was, my you have gotten so old. But of course, they didn't say it in English. They said, Gikadi, which is my Alka name, 
ki kari big game i mipa. And I said, miniti, big game mini, i minita, which means, and you too are just as old as I am. Ming Kai is the man that gave me the blowgun that I have here in my house, and he had given me his dart case as well. They have become Christians. I think all five of the men who had part in spearing the missionaries have become Christians, and there are many others too. The New Testament has been translated into the Alka language, for which we thank God. And Steve and his wife are there, along with other missionaries in other areas, who are doing their best to help the Indians to come to know Christ. We sat around in the hammocks, which furnish Steve and Ginny's house. They don't have sofas and chairs, they have hammocks, because, of course, that's what the Indians are used to. And so we sat or lay in the hammocks, and we talked, and we sang, and we hugged each other, and the songs that sound that the Alcas sing sound like this. And they get very solemn when they sing these songs. The women would all be standing around talking, laughing, hugging me, pulling my hair, talking about my rings or my bracelet or something. And then all of a sudden, somebody would start to sing. And everyone immediately became very solemn. And everybody joined in. And I joined in too, and the ones that I knew. And the second verse of that particular one goes, I have counted as many as 70 repetitions, so it does get a little old. Steve and Ginny, Ginny were wonderful host and hostess. They gave us bedrooms with real beds, they have a bathroom. In their house, they have a kitchen, they have a stove, they fed us, they put up with five foreigners, two whole days and two nights. So tomorrow, I'll tell you about our last day in the jungle. Part four in our short five-part series, A Trip to Ecuador. An incredible coincidence. Later on, we'll hear from missionary Frank Kohlinger. He'll talk about hunting with the Alcas. What was that like? Right now, a recording made decades ago, Ed McCauley and Jim Elliott. A question and answer session, this time dealing with whether there were some people who still had not heard of Jesus. It seems hard to believe in this day in which we live, particularly in the 20th century, that there might be people still existent that have never heard the name of the Lord Jesus. And uh, Jim, I want to ask you that question about some of these Oriente uh, Indians, do you think that there are some of them that still have been unreached that might possibly be reached in our generation? Yes, Ed, I certainly do, and they're not far away. In our own language group, the Quechuas, we don't know how many there are. It's estimated perhaps there are only about 10,000 in the whole tribe. But suppose we go for a little walk. Suppose we take off one day and go northeast to the mission station at Pano. That's a two-and-a-half-hour walk. And two and a half hours more will take us to Tena, the capital of our province. From Tena, we can walk about three hours to the north into a little region called the Archidona region. And there, we can find three to four thousand Indians, among whom the gospel has never been preached. Mind you, this is only about eight hours away from home. Eight hours away from the mission station in Shandia, you can walk into a group of three thousand people who, although they have heard the names of Christianity and give their children Christian names like Paul or John, but there is no real gospel being preached among them now, and there never has been a missionary walk into that plaza and preach the word of God among that particular group. If we go upstream, well, Pete and I one day, for instance, just took a little walk up river for a kind of a, uh, an afternoon trip. We walked about four hours, and we got into, into Indian houses where missionaries had never been before. White men have been there, but never missionaries. We were very sorry that we didn't have the, well, the language well enough to be able to tell the word right within four hours of our house, just upriver. So if you want to walk, Ed, you can walk to where there are plenty of people who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ proclaimed in power. Although they know that name, they've heard that name, they have no idea of who he is, nor what he means to them, nor what he was, what he was sent here to do for God. Ed McCauley and Jim Elliott. Later on, we'll hear about hunting with the Alcas, but right now, our program, The Alcas Today, 
wrapping up a trip to Ecuador. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliott, talking with you today in a very wild and windy rainstorm that we're having on the coast of Massachusetts. This is where we live, and this is where I do my taping for the program. And Linda Myers, my producer and director, who lives in Omaha, is sitting in the other room, uh, fiddling with the dials and doing everything that's involved in the mechanics of doing this radio program. Well, I've been talking all this week about a trip that my husband and I, my daughter and her husband and her oldest son, took to Ecuador in, 19, in January of 1996. A most marvelous example of the leading of God when one doesn't really know what to do or how to do it. It's not so easy, you know, to make travel arrangements when you're going into the jungle and you want to visit old friends who are Indians who live scattered all through the jungle. But we had wonderful visits with both the Quechua Indians, with whom I spent eight of my 11 years, and a wonderful visit with Steve Saint, son of Nate Saint, missionary pilot, who died in 1956. Steve and his wife have established a little village on the Kuraray, the Kuraray River, not very far from where the five men were speared to death. Steve named that little village Nimompadi for his dear Aunt Rachel. Rachel Saint went to be with the Lord in November of 1994, but she had been a faithful missionary with the Aukas, who are now called Waurani, for many years. We stayed with Steve and Jenny, and Walt and Lars and Valerie and her son Walter had very much wanted to take a real jungle trail trip. And they talked about this for a long time, and Steve had told us that if they wanted to see Gikita, who was one of the oldest, well, he was the oldest man in the tribe, and he was one who had had part in the killing of five missionaries, but he was now a Christian, Steve said, if you want to go and visit him, it's going to take you a seven-hour walk, and it is a rugged one. Well, I said, I won't be going along. Oh, yes, you got to go, Mama, said Val. We have to have a jungle trail experience again. And I said, I've been there. I've done that. I won't be going. You know, about 30 minutes is enough of that if you don't have to. So the day came, the second day that we were staying with Steve and Jenny, and off they went. Val, however, was a bit under the weather, and I felt that that was providential. She didn't go along, but the four men, Jess, Jesse, Steve's son, and an Indian guide, and Walt and Walter and Lars, went in the plane to a certain point where Steve let them off, and then they were to walk back home. Well, it was a rugged trip, and it was mud, and when they got back home, they were soaked. I mean, they looked like drowned rats, and they had mud up to the hips. They had gone over a very rugged trail. Lars described a part of it as being slanted, sort of on the edge of a slope, and in his Georgia accent, Lars said, I'm telling you, if you'd slipped on that trail, you wouldn't have stopped for a while. Well, they didn't go to the bottom of the ravine, but there were some ups and downs, and there were some severe ridges that they had to climb up and go down. And Walt, my son-in-law, who's a very big man, did a whole lot of falling down, he told us. He fell, he slipped, he stumbled. They had to go through streams. They had to climb up steep hills and down, and they had a full jungle experience, and it rained. I mean, it rained. You really don't know what rain is until you go to the rainforest. We always used to say we have two seasons in the year. We have the rainy season, and then we have the rainier season. And this was only the rainy season, so it wasn't really supposed to be too bad. But they came back and they had to admit that they had had a real jungle trail experience. In the evenings, all the Indians crowd into Steve and Jenny's house. And they sit in the hammocks and they sit on the floor and they stand around and they talk and they laugh and they talk and they talk and they talk. Now, when I lived with the Indians, 
they went to bed usually between 6.30 and 7. And they used to wake up between 2.30 or 3. But things have changed since civilization came in. And now that there's a house to go into, and a house that's always wide open to them any time of the day or night, in they came. And they wanted to sing for us. And they sang. And the school teacher, yes, they have a school now. They have Alka children, Wild Annie children, who are learning Spanish, who are learning to read and write both Spanish and Waurani, and they've learned to sing gospel songs. And so they sang for us, and they sang, and they sang, and they sang. And then they asked us to sing. And so, of course, we sang in English. doesn't make any difference to them. They didn't understand it any more than we understood the words that they were singing. But we sang little choruses, some of them. We even sang some motion songs like Climb, Climb Up Sunshine Mountain. And we had a wonderful time. And they prayed, and they sat in the hammocks. And Steve and Ginny introduced each one to us. One of my dearest friends was Ippa. Those of you that have seen the video called Through Gates of Splendor, which tells the story of what happened on January the 8th, 1956, may remember that there were there was a friendly contact that the five missionaries had before they were speared to death. That contact was on January the 6th, 1956. Two women and one man. The women were a young woman named Gimari and an older woman named Mintaka. The man was nicknamed George by the missionaries, and George as it turned out, as I learned later when I went to live with these people, he had two wives. And George was speared to death, or speared, I should say, not speared to death, but speared with the intention to kill, by his two brothers-in-law. And his two wives refused to dig a grave for him. When a person is in the bad graces of a tribe, they're not buried. And so George demanded that he be buried alive. Well, one of those two wives was my dear friend Ippa. She was a helper to me. She would carry water. She would wash dishes for me sometimes. She would even wash clothes. And there was dear Ippa sitting in the hammock in Steve Saint's house. I could hardly take it in. And then there was Oman Kitty and different ones who talked and talked and talked and tried to fill me in on everything that had happened since 1960 when I left that tribe. I had spent two years with them, and then I had gone back to work with the Kichwas, and a great deal had happened in the meantime. And so they were reminiscing. And there was Dabu, my favorite man, the sweetest man, one of the men who had no part in what happened to the five missionaries, And he reminded me of the time that he had been bitten on the lower lip by a snake. There's a picture of him in my book, The Savage, My Kinsman. And he remembered that, and he said, Gikari, ponimi, bitu, wa, kebita, butu, ya, ya, wetabupa. Do you remember, Gikari? Do you remember how I cried? Do you remember how you helped me? And of course I said, yes, ponimupa, I remember. And he said, I'm a Christian now. I am a God believer. We live well now. We love God now. Thank you for coming. Can you imagine the experience of seeing those dear people and realizing what a long way they've come? Thank God for the missionaries, the different ones that have been there. And there have been quite a group. Kathy Peake and a German woman named Rosie Jung did the translation of the Bible into the Waurani language. A tremendous job. So will you pray for those Indians? Will you pray for them? The word is W-A-O-R-A-N-I. Waurani. It means the people. And that's the name they give themselves. They're no longer called Alcas. A-U-C-A, but Waurani. Pray for them. Pray that God will protect them from the evils that the white men are so prone to bring in. 
Pray that God will keep them faithful to the things that they have learned. And thank God for all the way that he led us. I think of how the children of Israel were commanded to remember all the way that the Lord their God had led them those 40 years in the wilderness. God doesn't want us to forget his faithfulness. It helps to keep a journal. I'm glad that I have a journal and I can look back and see the amazing faithfulness of God from a perspective so different and very often so much sharper than when you're in the midst of that situation itself. Our God will guide us even unto death. This God is our God. He will be our guide even unto death. That's what the Bible says. That was the final program in our five-part series called A Trip to Ecuador. It was called The Alcas Today. What was it like, speaking of the Alcas or Wild Toddy people, to go hunting with them? Veteran missionary Frank Kohlinger had that experience. My very first trip I took was, uh, I, w- I went to Ecuador to stay in July of 1964. And in January of 65, I walked in from Arajuno over to the Curarai, down on a canoe with a couple of men from there, and then walked on into the settlement and um, met Rachel Saint at the time. And uh, the, the, the next day, the Alcas were going on a hunting trip, so I went with them. They and uh, I, helping a little bit, we shot a, a taper. And uh, we were all together, and all of a sudden, when the dogs were barking and the Alcas ran and the Kichuas who were with them ran, they just ran through the jungle where the animal was. And all I could do is, not seeing anybody, <clears throat> follow the noise, and I finally caught up with them. Yes, a lot of good experiences. Veteran missionary Frank Kohlinger. Well, our time together has uh, just about come to an end again. We do have a little bit more from Frank coming up before we end. But right now, let me thank you for letting us come into your home, your office, maybe on the drive or as you were doing some walking or jogging. Thanks for letting us come along with you. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out all the resources, lectures, devotionals, videos, and more at elizabethelliot.org. That's elizabethelliot.org. Thank you for doing this. I hope it's helpful and that you can be you know, useful to whatever purposes you want to use it for for people to remember Ecuador and the price that was paid, well, 60 years ago now, and uh, they don't forget. Until next time, may God remind you each and every day that you're loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are the everlasting arms. <laughs>